So we are now recording. So welcome. Um, welcome back um, to the book launch for our colleagues Isabella Rega and Andrea Madrado's new book. Isabella, of course, most of you know, but she's an associate professor here at Bournemouth in digital media for social change and global research director at Jesuit Worldwide Learning. Um, she's led lots of projects, um, most notably, but not all, uh, with the AHRC, including one of the projects which I think will be spoken about today. And she serves on the advisory board of Journal of Media Literacy Education and is a board member of the International Development Informatics Association. And welcome to Andrea Madrada, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Media and Communication at the University of Westminster. And she's leader of the Cultural Identities and Social Change theme at the Communication and Media Research Institute. Of course, leader for the BA in Digital Media Programme as well. Uh, again, um, too many projects and roles to really list here, uh, <laughs> but she was principal investigator on AI for Social Good and co I on the project with Isabella for AHRC eVoices and is currently the vice president of IAMCR. And I'm going to forget what that acronym stands for. It's going to be International Association Media and Communications Research. So I remembered. And both of them have published uh, widely. And um, I think the book's amazing. I'm about halfway through it. Um, but I will now hand over to the authors to speak to it for themselves. So the floor is yours, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julian, uh, for having us here. It's such a pleasure to be here, you know, presenting our book and camp um, has always been so generous. And I think so much of, our, of this project would not really have existed if it wasn't for all the support that we got from, from camp, from you, from colleagues at Bournemouth University. So we're very happy to be here. The book launch has the same title of the book, Media Activism and Artivism. So the combination between art and activism, as one can imply, to fight marginalization uh, in the global south. It is a rather long title, <laughs> but in any case, uh, it says really what uh, the book is about. And yes, I'm Andrea Medrado. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. I won't say much about me, and I uh, have a pleasure, you know, to um, be talking about this book that I co-wrote with Isabella. So next, Isa. Um, so the whole book um, was developed around this idea of South to South communication, which ended up being a subtitle of the book, but perhaps should be the main title. Um, it's basically an, uh, these ideas that different narratives across different so-called global Souths when they meet, when they intertwine, um, there's a transformation that happens, something really powerful, and these narratives really enrich each other. We are specifically looking at the African and Latin American continents and Brazil and Kenya, the two countries, and why is that? You know, sometimes something that we get asked, I sometimes ask like, okay, if these were countries in the globe, so-called global north would be get asked this question. But in any case, of course, there were practical reasons for, for that. Um, this research is building from our networks that we had you know, with our researchers in Brazil. I mean, I've been doing research on media activism in Brazil for many years and also in Kenya. But I think in both countries uh, have in common, although they have, of course, very, very different contexts, but have in common this idea that the media representations of the urban poor are sometimes very simplistic, you know, and they have this dualisms between the good citizen and the criminal person, the informal city and the formal city. And in addition to this, um, there's also, you know, a very active kind of online um, activist community in both countries. So there are some reasons why we looked at Brazil and Kenya, the focus of the presentation today. Um, we also looked at different artistic languages within the topic of artivism and specifically animation, building also on the expertise of um, colleagues that were part of the eVoices project from which, which uh, the research for this book uh, stems from. And this idea that these artistic uh, languages, these artistic creative activities can challenge colonial hierarchies that really develop, devalue all the global South knowledges, histories, and stories. And we'll tell you more about that in a moment. Specifically today in the presentation, uh, we will refer to two animations that were produced from two animation workshops. One was in um, 
in Kenya about uh, Marielle Franco, who was a Brazilian politician, uh, a cria de favela, someone who was born and raised in a shanty town in Brazil, someone who's been marginalized in many intersectional levels. So in Kenya, with the artists there, uh, we created an animation workshop and an animated film to honor her. And then later, the filmmaker Nyendo Muki in Brazil, as part of a different project, also conducted an animation, uh, sorry, produced an animation to honor Wangari Matai, this time a Kenyan powerful, you know, politician, activist, female figure. And the animation was made this time by Brazilian artists. Uh, so we'll speak a bit about these two experiences and asking how can these artivist practices be used as tools for solidarity, for challenge, contesting these colonial legacies of lack of mutual knowledge about each other across the different global Souths in the plural. We draw from intersectional and decolonial perspectives, proposing what we are referring to as a South to South understanding of media activism and artivism that mobilizes these memories and these histories that are often not shared, not told. Next, Isa. Okay, so do we do have to say what we mean by the global South and the South, I keep talking about that. It's obviously not a simple uh, geographic location. It's much more than that. You know, often we speak about the South as a metaphor for oppression and inequality and marginalization. And of course, as we know there, North in the South and South in the North. We can talk about that during, you know, Q and A. Um, but the, the the term the South, the global South, is useful in many ways because it really conveys this idea of a political solidarity project. This idea that the different communities in the global South can form some allegiances, can start some conversations about colonial legacies, colonial scarring, colonial he perhaps healing from these scars. So it's really a conversation starter in a way across the, glo the global south. But it's also a pro problematic term in many ways because it kind of lumps together all the others and otherizes the other even for further. Um, so anyway, as I said, it's a conversation starter. And in our book specifically, we find this idea of the political solidarity project quite useful and quite powerful for the dialogues that we worked with. So next is... So this book draws from the research that we did when we were working on the Voices project. Isabella was the PI and I was the co-I. At the time, I was based at the Federal Fluminense University in Brazil. Uh, and it, it happened across mostly the year 2018, but also a bit of 2019. Uh, we had a kickoff meeting in Bournemouth in January, lovely weather, uh, where we discussed some of the key themes that we wanted to work with during the project. Then a few months later, we organized an event in Rio hosted by the Maré Museum, which is a museum located in a favela, so a shantytown area. Not, I think it's one of the few museums in Brazil located within the kind of premise areas of a, of a favela, a shantytown. And at the time, uh, we were very shaken because Marielle Franco had been murdered along with her driver in March 2018. And she meant so much, you know, for the activists in the favela. She was a fighter for human rights, the human rights of the urban poor in favelas, very vocal against, you know, police brutality, racist police brutality. She was a woman, a lesbian, someone born and raised in a favela. And, you know, she becomes a rising star and she's is killed, you know. So it was very, very strong and really moved us. And we thought this story, this narrative of Marielle can provide a kind of a connective thread between, you know, the fights of the Brazilians and the Kenyans. So that's why in August that year, we did a workshop to honor Marielle with the Kenyans making this film about her. And uh, we will talk about this process a little bit um, later in the presentation. Then later in the year, um, we, um, we had an event back at the museum uh, in Rio, so it was kind of full circle, you know, in Brazil, then Kenya, then back to Brazil, back to Rio. We also did an exhibition with the frames that were used to make the animation. The filmmaker, Nyendo Muki, Kenyan uh, artist, you know, went there and talked to the Brazilian activists. So it was really a kind of a full circle conversation that we were able to have, you know, across the different global south. So next. Here comes the time to <laughs> the book. So um, all this is kind of um, the the key the key premises for the book that we worked with, and I'll just um, 
go next is I go over kind of uh, the chapters very quickly. For the first chapter, um, we discussed this idea of south to south dialogues and basically it's like an outline of the main arguments of the book. One thing that we do in the book is that we seek these conceptualizations of, you know, in what ways is a south to south dialogue unique? Uh, on chapter one, we elaborate on this a little bit more. Can we have a kind of a, sorry, there's a typo, but can we have a kind of a South to South media activism that is in some ways distinctive from just media activism in general? What makes it special? And then we really work, you know, with our concepts and theories from intersectional perspective, the colonial authors, and we really prioritize. I think the book was really a journey for Isabella and I. Um, I hope she, Isabella agrees with me on this. But in a way, it was also a journey south for both of us. I mean, I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been between the UK and Brazil and many countries. Isabella can talk about her own identity, but we were kind of really looking at ways in which we could establish dialogues as well, not just between the actual artists and activists and the people that we were working with, but also in terms of the epistemologies, the theories. So really looking at how African authors can dialogue with Latin American authors. So a lot of the epistemologies that we work with, they also you know, do this kind of South to South dialogue. Chapter two is more specifically about the media activism in Brazil. And then we think about media activism in three main uh, terms, three main elements, this idea of collective memories, dialogues and media territories. And similarly, we do that in relation to artivism in Kenya. Uh, and again, this idea of mobilizing histories, collective memories, resources that activists have and how they activate them and creating media territories as well. On chapter four, we start talking about visibility and the visibility model, which is a model that we developed as a res uh, result of this research, because for activism, there's always this idea that visibility is almost like an end goal. You really need to be visible and you need to tell your story, you need to be heard. But when this happens, it also brings, you know, visibility, vulnerability at the same time. So how can people become activists in marginalized communities in the global south, become vulnerable, tell the stories that they need to tell, be seen in the way that they need to be seen, but in a way that they're also protected, you know, that they are not completely vulnerable and that ends up backfiring about the work that they do. On chapter five, we discuss specifically this experience of the animation, specifically the portrait of Marielle animation. So the animation about the Brazilian politician Marielle made in Kenya. And we talk about this also in relation to intersectional uh, perspectives and affective journeys. So it's all, uh, also about emotions, about fear, about hope, and how this artistic language is able to mobilize all these feelings and affections and yeah, the consequences that this has. And finally, the chapter six is our last chapter uh, in which we really reflect on the journey as a whole, um, also in terms of the authors, the epistemologists that we work with. I mean, my own way to look at some of the epistemologies change, you know, throughout the process of writing the book. Also, I started writing the book in Brazil and, you know, we started fi finished, sorry, finished writing the book when we were, you know, I was in the UK. So a lot changed, you know, in our journey. It took us, what, three years, right, Isa? So it was a bit of a, a journey as well. Uh, next. Oh, that's now you. Right? <laughs> that was my last slide. Yeah. So uh, what, we, what we want to do now is to focus on one element of, of the book and talking a little bit more about the animation um, workshop and the animation itself. Also, like, in relation to the other uh, animation that Andrea mentioned at the beginning, because I think that there is this idea of journey that is one fundamental idea of the book, that is also something that is happening to the artifacts that have been created uh, um, during this project. And I think this is one of the most fascinating elements so that this dialogue is a dialogue uh, between people and uh, through these artifacts that I, I have to say they have, this life of, of their own, and they are um, continue traveling um, without our agency being involved because they are owned by the people who produce them and who are um, display them in, in different in different uh, uh, settings. Um, so um, we, as Andrea said, when we were in in Kenya. 
we had an animation workshop led by Ngendo Muti and conceived from a pedagogical point of view by Paula Carlos, a colleague at Bournemouth University. And the idea was to have with, uh, with 20 young Kenyan artists and activists uh, that gather around the organization, local organization that called, it's called Power 254. Uh, that is an organization uh, working for human rights uh, um, in, and political freedom in Kenya. Um, so as, as Andrea said, the challenge was to um, work with this Kenyan artist on an animation about Marielle Franco to try, try to find uh, connections uh, between uh, the fight and the struggle of uh, young Kenyan artivists and activists and Brazilian ones. And this is not part of our project, but what happened next is that um, Ngendo Muki, uh, the, the director uh, of the animation, went to Brazil and Andre explained and work in a similar way. So with a similar pattern uh, in terms of workshop with uh, artists in Brazil. And, uh, and this creates uh, even more connection between, between the two experiences, lived experiences. Uh, because in this, in this case, uh, the animation was about uh, Wangari Matai, so a Kenyan figure. Why we chose animation? Um, because of it has some features that uh, really helped in the goals that we explained we wanted to, to, to test uh, in this project. First, it affords, it allows a range of different aesthetic, aesthetic devices to be used, such as drawing, paintings, collage, photograph. And it can use a range of physical materials that can be combined in a series of image to create a moving uh, piece. And working in this way also enable uh, artists with no previous experience of animation, but that are you know, experts in other media to use their artistic skills and combine them uh, in, in, a, you know, in a very short period of time. And also work on the metaphorical, uh, on a metaphorical level uh, when creating uh, this kind of exper experiment. Um, and then the, the last thing is that the workshop was conceived by Paula in a way in which uh, allows uh, collaborative practice. So because to make a co coherent piece, so to make a coherent animation, the 20 artists that were involved in the workshop had to dialogue between themselves, among themselves, to see uh, how to achieve uh, one, one, one goal, uh, one you know, um, single goal. So, so how we proceed, we collected um, hundreds of images online about Marielle when she was campaigning, when, when images of the protests that uh, erupted in Brazil when she was killed. Uh, there were like 900, uh, we printed them out and were like 900 frames uh, that the artists could use to, uh, during the workshop. Uh, so we printed them in letter size, as I said, and the, the, as you can see from the picture, what happened is that um, artists could work uh, on these uh, frames, printed frames, uh, with drawing collage in a manual way, however they wanted, add, adding pieces to, to the image or erasing and deleting pieces to the image to convey their, uh, their message. Uh, the question it was uh, that we asked them it was that um, you know how they they could affect the images they were working uh, on, uh, as I said, to make uh, to convey what they wanted to say about about Marie. Um, they started working on you know on um, on each of them to to on two frames on two pieces of paper and then. This grew and grew day by day. I haven't mentioned it. It was a four days workshop. And so like working with more frames and more frames and more frames, this created the dialogue. So from an individual reflection on what they wanted to make to a collective piece. 
Um, and, and then at the end, when all the images I wanted to intervene on were, uh, were you know, finished, done, uh, the images were scanned and, and animated. Um, yeah, so I have also to mention that um, in the same time, there were artists working on the soundtrack of the animation. And again, it was a soundtrack inspired by music that Marielle loved, uh, but also, uh, but it, it, it was, you'll, you'll listen to it in, in, in a moment. And I'm always amazed when I talk about it because it was produced, so like created and produced and recorded in the four days of, uh, of the workshop. Um, there is one thing that I haven't mentioned, but I think that from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, how the workshop was crafted and built point of view is very important. That is that um, at the beginning of this process, Andrea uh, made a very powerful presentation about Marielle and the context in which um, she lived and fight and, and, and worked. And this was really important because this was the, this was the first moment in which the connection uh, was created. So um, this is like I'm I'm talking about it as it was you know or like it, it it is artists working together. So like not everyone came to every day. Uh, some were chipping to, and 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 then had other things to do. But the ones who were present at the at the presentation that day, Andrea did were really invested and committed. So that was really a key, I think, moment um, for this workshop. What I want to do now is to show you the artifact, so the animation. Uh, so let, hopefully you can hear the sound, listen to the sound as well. Wow. History is sad, Yanni. But same time, it's time, Yanni. Design a kumbusha, ni kukumbushe. Check Yanni. Look within you, Jum, Tapata, on a Josaka. Jum, a wing will be funga. As I joy with your mother design, in a prove it's a new day. To confirm the sea, my eyes are red, too. Yamachozi nili. Nili mwakajana, but. In a hope, so I can still see. Nataka ni spell he jina, na si jina tu. Ni he jina ikona si katikati. Yani F R A N C O. But most importantly, M A R I E double L E. Yani na boka kusufranco Mariel. Mariel, Mariel. Tuli impotenza. Tulimpoteza Mariela kipigania haki za kina mama mwana lahoi wanyonge na walionyongwa na serikali Kweli hii serikali Ina serikali za kuiba maisha za watu Wa Hii serikali Ina serikali Za kuiba maisha za watu Long live in our hearts R.I.P.F. Maria Mwanasiasa mtetezi wa haki ya kina dada na bado mzazi alikuwa kawakili wa watu maskini wanaoteswa na serikali katili uh, wanatumia vikosi vya polisi kusimamishi ya watu maisha kwa risasi Yes um right as i said like i think Andrea can put in the chat the link to Omaji to Wangari we're not gonna show it uh, now, but you could see uh, here how a similar uh, experience uh, unfold uh, uh, um, when like this prominent figure uh, was um, uh, worked with by um, Brazilian artists. And yeah, so like what, what, what did we learn that animation made possible? What made possible was that participants were able to leave their own marking in the original image uh, with the materials and processes that they chose. 
Um, and this enabled them to relate to each other, to the message to Marielle Franco's story and the plot of Brazilian art activists uh, in, many, in many levels. Um, so what, what, what this enabled was for activists uh, to draw from their standpoints, to intervene upon images, transforming them into something meaningful. And I think I want to uh, end here and pass it over to Andrea again, because this creative process is what enabled Kenyan artists to connect to Brazilians and vice versa, and to initiate a dialogue that is what we are interested also a lot in the book from, you know, as Andrea was saying, from a, um, a um, experience point of view, lived experience point of view and an epistemological point of view. So I hope Andrea next will illustrate a little bit more about how this dialogue, dialogue took, took place. Yeah. Can, yeah. Okay. Yes. So we have re really this idea of the artivism as an en enabler of this South to South dialogue that I also be mentioned in the beginning uh, of the presentation as a kind of a conversation starter about all the struggles, all the challenges, all the marginalization, you know, the common threads that could be found between, you know, the artists we work with in both countries, Kenya and Brazil. But an interesting point here as well is this idea that art is the meeting point, is the starting point. And it's something that they were saying both in Brazil and Kenya. For example, one artist that we, inter we interviewed in Salvador who made the animation about Wangari, the Kenyan um, politician and activist, um, she, she wasn't, you know, this, this animation was not part of our project, but we were able to interview this artist. And she said, Art is really what, draw, what what brought us together. You know, everyone comes after the arts. Without the arts first, we wouldn't have learned the history. From a methodological perspective, I think this idea of art as the meeting point for the dialogue is very interesting. And also quite literally, because the way that the whole uh, dynamics of the workshops uh, were designed, it was all about people being together, literally sitting together in a circle, drawing, painting together and feeling really connected to each other as artists, but also as Isabella mentioned to this, this, the person who was being honored, you know, Marielle Mwangari, the filmmaker, you know, uh, Nyendo. So all these levels of different connections um, were, were created. Uh, next. Uh, Um, and also, I think something that's interesting is how, because of colonial legacies and how little we know about each other across the global south. I mean, I, for example, am from Salvador, which is like the African capital of Brazil, and we always use this word axé, which is a Yoruba word, and we reflect very little on what it means. We really don't know about each other's histories, stories, all the histories that we learn are so mediated, you know, by the so-called North. So in both, you know, experiences, the artists were talking about this, how powerful it was to learn about the histories, about the people, about Wangari, about Marielle, uh, finding this connection. So this quote here illustrates this. Uh, Marina was the, the author of a poem in the, in the Brazilian animation. Also, there was a song which was based on a poem created by the Brazilian artists. And she says in the poem, Wangari, your eyes are alive, sparkling over the Bahian Sea. And this refers to shared living histories, ancestry, and how ancestry can move us. And then they say, I was not familiar with the filmmaker, with Nyendo Muki. Um, I was not familiar with Wangari Matai, who she was, although Wangari is actually a quite famous figure. And of course, in Kenya, people were not familiar at all with who Marielle was. So all these ideas of learning and, and learning these different reference points um, that, you know, go beyond the usual Global North reference points that we are, you know, we have access to was very powerful for the participants in both countries. So next. And I think also this idea that both animations were about Black women, you know, and these women's conceptions of what it means to speak about human rights, environmental justice in Wangari's case, and this, in a way, um, on a more epistemological level, uh, connects to this idea of pluriversal approaches. You know, it's not about universalizing tendencies as if, you know, the truth is just the Western global North uh, truth. There are many, you know, a world in which many worlds uh, can coexist. And this idea that we can share these pluriversal stories, in a way, challenges these colonial hierarchies that really, really attribute such a lesser value to the Global South knowledges and histories and stories. So by creating this kind of artistic output, 
the archivists also helped unfreeze in a way each other's knowledges from a kind of fragmented colonial past, past and they come to life and breathe and inspire each other and quite literally in a way because animation is all about you know making images come to life and move so this connection really brought you know this mutual knowledges and this mutual learning to life next And both spoke about this power of connection. And we think about it also, you know, in epistemological, methodological ways. For example, in Nairobi, when the artists have worked on this idea of the animation to honor Marielle, they all spoke about it as a collective loss, you know, and also this heartbreak that was being felt, you know, um, across the continents from Brazil to Nairobi. We are heartbroken for what happened to Marielle in Rio. And I think this connection is, is so strong because it's created, you know, there's something about art and creativity that makes that makes it much stronger, much more effective, much more intimate. Uh, and made people think, you know, well, it's all very bittersweet. Of course, we don't want to be here, you know, making an animation about, about someone um, who was killed, you know, but the, I guess the sweet part of, of the bittersweet is that people then find out that they're not alone in their struggles, that there's very similar struggles happen, happening across the different global south. So in the quote, you know, Niendo, the director says, for example, they want to separate us. We, we, we think we need to be always dependent on the north, but we global south people, we have very similar struggles. And if we connect, we can kind of find solutions that can elevate our lives. So anyway, just a quote from the filmmaker. Um, and also these ideas that the stories are interconnected, and this was also very strong in both countries. Um, and this quote from a Brazilian artist, I think, really shows this. Um, she, she, she says that the stories cross each other all the time, whether we realize it or not. So I think something really interesting she said as well is that when, you know, in Brazil, they were making this animation, they kind of built a new collective memory. You know, she says, we, we managed to build a meaningful memory somewhere where there was a kind of a void before something you know a woman a story a history that was unknown to us so this was very impactful we learned histories but we also made histories and we can recognize ourselves in our stories in our histories to become stronger so drawing strength from these interconnected uh, stories this interconnectivity next that's you is <laughs> Yeah, um, we had the idea, but I, it's, I don't think we, we will do it actually, Andrea, but we had the idea of, because I have also to say that um, to Andrea that um, one of the tasks for this conference was for, uh, you know, our doctoral students to look at the MES presentations uh, that are on, on YouTube. But so one of the so one of the what we wanted to do now was to show you uh, one bit of uh, one of these uh, panel with, that we had at MES in like in in February, um, um, and in which we invited um, um, two artists from the from two Kenyan artists and two Brazilian artists and Paula as well. Uh, to dialogue about um, about the uh, the two animations, uh, this the the fragment that we wanted to show was uh, the piece in which they answer to, to to these questions. We're not gonna able to to show it now for time reasons, but uh, you have the link. Um, but I think that like their answer demonstrates uh, even more what Andrea just said about connection and and the power of of art, so it's worth listening to it. Um, I want to say another thing, Andrea, sorry, that uh, before we finish, because I think, you know, that, that was uh, uh, to go back to this idea of dialogue, that is a dialogue of people. And this is one of the ways that we have found to put in dialogue different like artists that were involved in these two different creation, these two different animations. And the other thing is that um, uh, the, um, animation a portrait of Marielle that was, as Andrea said, hosted by a, a, like an exhibition by the Museo da Marea is now at the Museo da, Republic, uh, da Repubblica, right? In Rio de Janeiro. Um, so it moved out uh, um, from, uh, from the Favela da Marea and is in the 
center of the um, of Rio de Janeiro now. And this was like an initiative done by the you know uh, Claudia, who is the uh, director of, of the museum itself. So like I wanted to finish this showing uh, this dialogue um, among people and uh, with uh, uh, the journey of, of the artifacts as well. And then I leave you to the concluding thoughts, Andrea. Thank you, Isa. Yes, exactly. So this shows how, again, not just the power of dialogue, but what I said in the beginning, that the conversation continues, it's a starter, and it's and it flows. And I think that there's much more, you know, to happen actually. And in a way, we we lose control, you know, as part of the of the project and the journey and the process. But that also I think makes me very happy and, and Isabella as well. It's, uh, I think it makes the experience uh, even more um, moving, I guess, for both of us that in a way things create a life on their own and the conversations being carried, carried on with all the challenges that exist for this conversation to take place, you know, all the colonial legacies, the language barriers, the cultural barriers, the financial barriers. But um, I guess it shows how, you know, these conversations really can go a long way. So paying homage to these two women, Marielle Wangadi teaches us the power, the connective power of stories and how transformative they can be. Uh, these South to South artivist dialogues are being defined, you know, by this idea of creating collective memory, sometimes, you know, to fill voids that were there before. When the workshops finished, the participants were touched by, you know, how they made something new and that something new referred to a newly uh, created collective memory. And it's all about also learning to unlearn negative information that we have, you know, about each other across Global South, in a way freeing ourselves to some extent, there are lots of barriers and, and difficulties, but starting to free ourselves a bit from some of the colonial mental loads that we all have about each other. And we ask ourselves, you know, was this just a passing transformative moment? Is it sustainable? And as I said, like the barriers are gigantic. I mean, to begin with funding, I think when we got this funding for the Voices project, it was the last time that this grant actually ran in the UK, it's not, it's not happening anymore. So that's the initial element. Of course, there are cultural barriers, uh, culture, different culture shocks as well about how artists work, how academics work. We know, for example, academic work expects a lot of unpaid labor in many ways that the artists cannot um, do. So there are lots of barriers and difficulties um, so, you know, can we really say that this is kind of a long term partnership and it is challenging, but in any case, I think the conversations were, were started, people are still, you know, in touch with each other. Now the artists also talking to each other in a way, and, you know, things will continue, the conversation will carry on. And we look at the South to South dialogues in terms of a potential, you know, potency, potential, the opening up of avenues for what I said, you know, in relation to a political solidarity project between Global South marginalized peoples. So that's, I think, what we had to say. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Isabella, did I forget anything that you want to add? No. We have maybe a few minutes for questions. I don't know, five? <laughs> yeah, five minutes for questions, yes. Thank you so much. Hilary has one. But you're on mute, Hilary. You're muted, Hilary. Of course I was. Um, congratulations on the book. Really important piece of work. And I can't wait to assign some chapters to my students. Um, but I was wondering, Andrea, you said something um, about how your own epistemologies or epistemological stances changed through the process of writing the book. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about your journey with that, please. Wow, yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> no, thanks, Hilary. That's a really good question. I mean, to begin with, the whole idea of the concept of the Global South I think in the very beginning, um, you know, the way that I'm looking at it now a bit more as a kind of a strategic alliance. When I first um, started working with this idea of the South, I was much more uh, focusing or prioritizing this element, you know, of the marginalization, you know, the inequality. And now I'm thinking about it in a more kind of a strategic way, even if it's a bit problematic. 
in a way that was a journey uh, for us. Another thing as well is that um, I think, you know, I, when we started this process, I was living in Brazil, you know, there were so many changes in our lives as well. So one thing that I started to do more and more, you know, and more deliberately, we, we, we started to discuss a lot about this, Isabella and I, is that towards, you know, chapter four, five, like the second half of the book, we started to deliberately start to prioritizing more, citing scholars from the global south, uh, establishing exchanges between African thinkers, Latin American thinkers, and doing this dialogue in a more kind of epistemological level as well. So I think we started a bit, it would it be fair to say is that we started a bit more north centric and then we started going more south and south and south as we wrote uh, the book. And it was kind of a deliberate choice. And it's funny because I was by the time here in the UK, I don't know if it was some kind of nostalgia because then I'm, I moved away from the South and in the North, I'm trying to stay connected to the South. But it's something that happened, I think, looking really deliberately for kind of a more um, South-centric um, references and reference points, both in methodological, epistemological, uh, and the experiences that we're sharing, of course, as well. Can I add one thing um, that is also Andrea's merit that I think it's 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 really good <laughs> in this book, if I can say because I say something about Andrea, is that this intertwine with the fact that if, if you read it, you see that in the chapter there is we share also a lot of our lives during this period. And I think that also helped this process. So like this epistemological shift or shifting from thinking that there are hierarchies and things that can be said, cannot be said, can be part of research and cannot be part of research and struggle that we live when we are researching that like affect how we, uh, how we yeah, work through the process. And usually this is not told, but I think one thing that happened in this book and this and 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 that that these stories were shared also. So these these personal stories or some bits of our personal stories were shared. And this was very powerful, powerful. And again, for me, not at all, not at all the way I would do it. So like, I have to thank my, my <laughs> for this because I think uh, yeah no I think that this also helped the, like the way that is written help uh, this journey and show the journey. I was, I think, in the conclusion chapters that both Isabella and I, of course, you're exhausted writing the conclusion. And we're both moms. It's something that's special as well about Isabella and I. Since we connected the first, very first time, the motherhood element, and we have children kind of around the same age, and our children all got sick. <laughs> My kid and Isabella. So we, we wrote about it, you know, and that I think that's also part of the journey uh, and about this whole universalizing tendency. Why is it that you cannot identify where you're at in your life, who you are, where you're coming from? That's a kind of a very colonial thinking. So in a way, we, we kind of played around that too. Like, um, I mean, the whole decolonizing has been so colonized by now, but uh, that we were kind of in a way decolonizing the story in a way like that as well, that we were really situating ourselves in this journey um, of, of producing this. Um, which was very hard, very challenging, but I think, of course, also very rewarding, especially now that it's done. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm really sorry to bring it to a close because um, it was amazing. And um, thanks so much for, for doing that today and sharing that with us. And uh, um, I will stop recording now. Thank you.